Greetings, dear listeners. This is Jonah Goldberg, host of the Remnant Podcast, brought to you by the Dispatch and Dispatch Media. Uh, I'll spare you all the backstory, but this this has been a podcast a long time in coming. Uh, The great Nellie Bowles of the Free Press has a book out called Morning After the Revolution, Dispatches from the Wrong Side of History. And we've wanted to have her on for a while, but she is also, I think the technical term for it is Mondo Pregnant. And... um, (laughs) And she basically said she was done with podcasts, but since we had gotten the request in, she said we will, she'll make time for us. And then we had all sorts of scheduling issues. And um, so if you remember that scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark where uh, Harrison Ford, Indiana Jones has to get out of the Aztec temple. Um, and at the last <laughs> second, he's the giant stone walls coming down and he reaches in to grab his hat um, and he pulls it out just in time. For purpose of this podcast, uh, this is Nellie Bowles' last podcast before she goes away to make babies. And um, and so basically, she's the hat, and I am Indiana Jones here. So Nellie Bowles, thank you for coming on. It is such a pleasure to be here. I realized that I, I had to stop being exposed to the world because someone – in like a book, uh, you know, actually Andrew Sullivan and I were talking and he asked me what year I started at the Times. And I swear to God, I completely forgot. And I had to Google my own name during the pod to see that, yes, it was January 2017. And then I was like, 2017, it was 2017. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I need to, I need to now just like hide in a little cave, like maybe a red tent and, um, and, and, and prepare for childbirth. Because your mind does go. So anyway, yeah, I if I don't sound smart, it's not because I'm not smart to the podcast listeners who may not see my pregnancy. It's because I'm pregnant. So um, I, it might be a Gen X thing, but the second the calendar flipped to the 2000s, my ability to narrow down events in my life to a given five-year period <laughs> has uh, completely evaporated. And um, Oh, no. So I'm pretty bad about that kind of thing anyway. Again, as I, as you were saying before Jonah we started might be taping, pregnant too. Yeah, I uh, like I I wish I had the benefit of being pregnant to explain my constant need for naps and 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 <laughs> blanking out on things. But all right, so uh standard protocol says first question for any bo- author promoting a book uh is the same question I always want when I'm on book tour. What's your book about? So, what's your book about? Yes. I I workshop this because for a while my answer was sort of like, oh, book about the left and stuff and me and like, I don't know, the last few years essays. Um, But my new special answer is this is a book about how the smartest people in America lost their minds, how I almost did too, and how we can get back to a little bit of sanity. Concise. You workshopped it well. Um, Thank you. And for listeners who don't know, uh, the book is actually a collection of essays from this. The the dispatches from the wrong side of history is not just evocative. It's also like somewhat accurate insofar as it's like different snapshots of different tumults um, of the last of the woke era. I mean, is that what we can call it? Um, That that works. It's it's a revolution that really doesn't want to be named and really doesn't want to be described and and kind of sees you immediately as oppositional if you try to name it or describe it. Right. Yeah, that's a um, very... Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. So that sort of gets at, and as I sort of hinted at you when we were talking in the quote unquote green room, um, um, I wanted to be a conversation, so I'm not going to do a lot of the standard and then read me this part from your book. But I do want to tell listeners... Who want that? Uh, you did a really wonderful podcast with Barry Weiss, your significant other, um, in all sorts of ways, uh, legal and commercial, um, for, the, for her podcast, uh, honestly. And and she was much, I'll put it this way, she was much more familiar with the material than I am um, in every way, shape, or form. And so I highly recommend for people who want a more granular look at this to go check out that podcast. We'll put it in the show notes. This is all, I feel a little bit like Santa and Miracle on 34th Street telling people, telling kids to go shop at Gimbel's. Um, but uh, it's all within the family. So you say about, you make a good point about how it's a revolution that doesn't want to be named. I have a theory about this. Yeah. Um, which is that, you know, there's this famous line. It actually doesn't come from the people who's, who usually attribute it to them. Um, but there's this concept of 
the long march through the institutions, these, mm. you know, how the left took over all of these, the commanding heights of the culture. And it actually comes from the 1970s, but it's attributed to this guy who I'm spacing a sort of Frankfurt school Marxist guy. And, um, and I think that sort of gets at part of the problem is, is, is they want to have their cake and eat it too. Insofar as they want revolutionary ends, but they want to hide behind establishment credibility. Mm, um, yes. and so there are a lot of revolutionary sort of unconstrained vision types running a lot of these elite institutions, but whenever they get into trouble, they fall back on their, their, the prestige of the institution to defend what they're doing as just sort of best practices rather than actually yes. anything else. And so and scientific language and right. So why don't we start sort of there? It's, um, um, it's fairly interesting. I mean, it's, it is a movement that doesn't like being named that doesn't want to be called out. And in part, like you say, it's useful because right. you can do big changes and say, we're not doing any changes. And right. it, it's like, the, let's say with um, preferential hiring practices and DEI, um, if you say the, the movement wants preferential hiring practices, but if you say there are preferential hiring practices happening, right? you're, you're not supposed to like say the thing that's, it's very strange. You're supposed to play the game of fighting for a thing, getting the change, but then saying there's been no change. You're not allowed to notice the change and talk about the change, which is really weird and confused, like quite confusing. Um, yeah. So like one of the chapters you have on here, this is, and this is a very much a remnant bingo card topic um, is um, um, abolish the police or defund the police. Yeah. And it seems to me that this tracks perfectly this phenomenon where there's really no more sort of radical idea than to basically in effect, private, you know, abolish the the police function of the state. It's like what the state is actually for. Going back to Max Weber or, or I don't know Hammurabi is to police crime. Now, what counts as a crime? Sometimes in past societies, shouldn't have been counted as a crime. But like everyone agrees, like, like I don't know, rape, murder, these things are basics crimes, and that you need someone in charge of making sure that they don't happen or the people who do them are punished for it. So why don't you sort of talk through the chapter about, about abolish the police a little bit? Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting because it, it shows in part how the movement that now is the progressive movement and, and the American left, it's a very unusual kind of leftism, a very unusual kind of progressivism, because let's say abolish the police. Perfect example. You have a, a movement that wants people called violence interrupters and community uh, community helpers instead of cops. And of course, this comes from the murder of George Floyd. And it comes from this like righteous rage that a lot of us felt. And, and, and the answer was, we need to get rid of the policing system altogether. We need to get rid of the cops altogether. And we need to do this new utopian vision. But what that looks like is a bunch of guys from the community being hired. And, and usually these are good guys in the community, in the neighborhood who genuinely want less violence, less gun violence. And for the violence interrupter program, let's say, looks like a bunch of guys being hired to wander around the neighborhood and get in the way of violence, to quote unquote, interrupt violence. And they go out without body armor. They go out without guns, of course. And they go out without pensions, without unions. And they, of course, report more being more victims of 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 um violence of gunshot wounds of they they report astronomical levels of violence that they themselves suffer from without any of the protections of the things that the boring old liberals used to argue for like the boring old liberal response to a George Floyd event would be we need better trained cops we need better uh, sort of they need more funding like w w the unions and the pensions, these are good things for people who are putting themselves in harm's way. And they, we need to do more funding to make the cops better. I'm not the first to make that argument. But um, in the chapter on defund, I write about a, the one particular violence interrupter and his work and the program in general and sort of the 
strangeness of an American movement that wants to, yeah, like you said, basically privatize or, or, um, just really destabilize the, the basic function of the state, which is to protect citizens. Um, and then I also write about the weirdness of how fast the American media class went along with this. I mean, it was, it was just a foundational belief. If you didn't, I, I remember when I was still kind of trying to like get along with the movement at the times and trying to like play good and, and fit in, I remember being like, well, like in a conversation with colleagues, like, well, no, it's, it's not that I'm not for defunding the police. I just don't think we should <laughs> abolish. I just don't right. think we should abolish guys. And that was considered like the wild centrist take within a bunch of New York times reporters. Yeah. And I, I look back on that. Obviously, I'm embarrassed myself for like arguing for something I didn't even agree with, but that I thought was sort of the more moderate, like save my skin position. And also just like, how did the rhetoric get to the point where a group of New York Times reporters baseline was the police should be abolished? And I think that now we're in this funny moment where a lot of the excesses of the movement were all pretending didn't happen. And now you would be hard pressed to find a reporter who would be willing to say that abolish the police was something that anyone was for. Um, but it happened. It was a movement and it had some wins. And yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, one of my favorite moments was when it, when even people like Jim Clyburn were like, guys, slow your roll. We, <laughs> we, we, we can't actually win campaigns calling for getting rid of police. And like, I was very into this stuff at the time. And I looked at all the polls. There was not a single poll anywhere in America that said, get rid of the police. There were polls, like a majority of African Americans said they wanted, um, like the same amount of police or something like that. And some, yeah. and a significant number said fewer police, but there's a huge difference between fewer and zero. Right. I mean, like, yeah. um, and, uh, and, and it was starting to dawn on sort of the MSNBC producer, New York times op-ed crowd that like, Oh crap, we allowed ourselves to get talked into this thing that is going to get us killed at the polls. And so you had this moment, these moments, and I, I can't remember the names of them, but I wrote them down at the time and wrote about them, where you would have these anchors on like MSNBC get, you know, the professor of, oh. of dog barking is allowed on this podcast. Don't worry about it. Uh, um, you get like the, you know, the professor of sociology from UC Fresno on who's written countless non-peer reviewed pieces, you know, articles on, um, the carceral state and the, you know, the prison industrial complex. And they'd be talking about, you know, defund the police and the anchors would be like, well, when you, when you say defund, what you really mean, we should just be clear to the listeners. We mean, you know, reallocate resources to violence interrupters and more help mental health services, but we still want some police. And then they're like, no, 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 we're quite serious. We want no police. <laughs> and yeah. And at one point the times it's actually ran an op-ed saying, I think literally the headline of the op-ed was, yes, we mean abolish the police. <laughs> and it was exactly. like the, re it was, the yes, refusal of the radicals literally. to go along, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so and just explain to me, like my theory about this has always been like, like that there is this, the blood brain barrier between sort of elite campuses and um, sort of radical expert types, um, credentializers of these ideas and the sort of 26 year old booker from, or producer from, you know, who got a degree from Brown. They don't know that the, because again, this, they don't realize that the people that they think are the experts are actually revolutionaries. They think, oh, well, this is team. He has a PhD. He's tenure. He must be right. And so they lose this ability in the way that fish don't know they're wet of understanding that like being an uncritical transmission belt from these corners of academia is actually bad for progressivism and bad for liberalism. Um, how, how accurate is that? I I think that assumes that people are naive in a way that I don't think that people were entirely naive about what was happening in 2020 and 2021 with the rhetoric and into 2022. And now I would say 23 is when it slowed down. 
I don't think people were naive about what they were doing. I think there was a concerted effort to do a revolution. And you had the COVID lockdowns, which were really helpful to the movement. And which I think after the vaccines came out and you saw the movement still argue, we still need to be locked down. We still need, you, you had kind of a moment of radical change in everyday Americans' lives. And the movement wanted to take advantage of that. I don't think that the bookers were naive about what they were doing. I think it was like, let's go for it. Let's, let's do this. And the, the, the tools they had were new tools. So you could sort of point to a tech factor where you could say that internal slacks within newsrooms and institutions became ways to flatten the hierarchy to give that booker power they didn't used to have. At least within the times, that was how it worked. Like all of a sudden, a few young staffers who hadn't proved themselves as great reporters could be yelling at the editor in chief in the all company 4,000 person slack room. And the editor in chief felt obligated to respond and to to answer them and to basically get on their level and say, you know, you make some good points, but I would disagree here. And so you had the tools that flattened hierarchies and you had Twitter. So you could have a few, let's say at MSNBC or at CNN, there was always the risk that a couple of these folks, these young folks could go rogue and start tweeting about you. And and if you're an executive of one of these companies, you're a little scared of that because you've seen other people get fired when five people started tweeting mean things about them. So no, I think it was very clever. I think that, I think lockdowns were a really big part of it and that with all of us fractured and a lot of our community services shut down, a lot of our communal spaces shut down, um, again, even after we had the vaccine, that there was a concerted effort to do a revolution and to, 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 you know, a, a revolution of abolishing the police, a revolution around, around gender, a revolution. I mean, to, to, to get some of these things through at least. And, and I have a chapter about San Francisco in, in San Francisco, it was, there was a reason why the school board waited for lockdowns to say, we're finally getting rid of our elite public high school. What did right. that have to do with lockdowns? Right. Nothing. Right. right. But that was the moment when they were like, you know what? Everyone's kind of feeling fractured and distracted and out of sorts. We're going to get rid of our version of Stuyvesant now. This is our moment. We're going to, they decided we're going to rename all the schools in San Francisco or half the schools in San Francisco to get rid of famous racist names such as Abraham Lincoln, Diane Feinstein. And a lot of this stuff is really funny. And I try to like make it funny when I'm writing about it, but it's also just like kind of impressive for, for if you think about how quickly it all moved. And um, yeah, and for a few years, they did get rid of the elite public high school in San Francisco. And um, these longtime goals of this movement were, they succeeded. So I don't think it was naive is what I, what I would say. So I think it, it was it, very it, smart. It's, it's an interesting point. Um, I would argue... I'll, 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 I'll credit that you're right about the individual people who are doing this. There is still a level of naivete involved here of insofar course, as of course. like, um, you know, the idea that you are actually going to succeed long term with an effort to abolish police is it may have been intentional, as you say, but at the conceptual level, it is profoundly naive, right? That like, let's, you know, like you have a great chapter about, uh, was it Chaz? They kept changing its name, um, which was the autonomous zone in Seattle where, um, you know, they, you can say that they were sincere and that they were doing everything that they were doing deliberately, deliberately, but the idea that it would work is a level of naivete at the conceptual level that is really kind of astounding, right? I mean, this idea, well, just, just, we won't, we don't need any of these bourgeois norms about police or hygiene or whatever. We'll just, we'll go for it and we'll have this utopia. And like the history of utopias is, or utopianism is the history of reality kicking people in the ass um, because utopias don't work. I think one of the things that was behind a lot of these different threads in this movement 
was this idea that we've gotten human nature wrong, that human nature is good. And this is, of course, always behind every utopian movement. None of this is like new, right? Humans behave in cyclical ways. Like we just repeat ourselves. But this idea that humans are good. And I mean, I was at many dinner parties where people, you sound like the asshole if you're saying, no, people are bad, even if we eliminate sexism and racism and hetero supremacy, even if we get rid of all that stuff, people will still hurt each other. And you sound like a kind of a jerk because what you're saying is that people have dangerous natures and that they're not pure and good. And and I think the movement can, very much was full of a lot of young people, very much is full of a lot of people who genuinely believe people are good. And in part, that comes from the success of America. Like America is so safe in a lot of ways. We're so rich. We can't imagine danger. And a lot of people pushing this also, they live in beautiful, very safe neighborhoods. If you live in Park Slope, Brooklyn, if you live in a, a lovely bucolic neighborhood of DC, like you can't imagine danger. And I think th that um, just there's a lot of young people in America who genuinely can only imagine prosperity and abundance and safety. And so when you talk about human frailty and cruelty and that we're that we're animals who will hurt each other and steal from each other, that sounds so bizarre. That sounds so foreign. So I want to come back to this human nature thing because it's a big thing of mine. Um, crooked timber of humanity will never be made yeah. straight, all that stuff. I agree with that yeah. entirely. But I want to get back to the young people for just a second because uh, – The youths. The youths are at it again. Yeah. One of my great gripes, particularly <laughs> during this whole period that you're writing about and talking about and all this kind of stuff, is that um, – and I agree with you entirely about the flattening from technology and Slack channels and all that kind of stuff. I, it's so I, depressing to see like the editor in chief have to weigh in with like a wire cutter, like intern as it was like crazy. Yeah. So like to me, it's very reminiscent, obviously without the bloodshed of the cultural revolution in China, mm. where the olds who are locked into this, you know, running dog, capitalist, Confucian mindset, whatever, had to be humiliated and shamed by the youngs who, you know, would, you know, uh, think that we could start over at year zero kind of thing. Yeah. What, what, what explains the, among the Gen X people I know um, mm -hmm. in Washington, it is remarkable to me how many of them, the Gen Xers and the younger baby boomers, are at these elite institutions are just freaking terrified of young people and they mm. bend over backwards to them. And in my experience, you know, the whole point of having the grizzled old, you know, editor who's been around the block a few times is the capacity of telling the youngins, go do your homework. You don't know what you're talking about. And that seems to have completely gone out the window. Is there a, is it baby boomer nostalgia for the 1960s? Is it an ideological <laughs> thing? What is it that, creates so many sausage spines where they just cave to, you know, the, the little sort of, you know, cosplaying Maoist mobs or digital Mao Maoist <laughs> mobs the way they did. I think the, 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 the technology is part of it, right? Like we have Twitter and it's very scary to be the target of a Twitter mob. It's genuinely very scary. Yeah, and there. I think yeah. people are terrified of being that. And so we have technology that we haven't quite evolved the, strength to you know oh okay it's just twitter it actually is just twitter and to to be able to step back from it and i think um you see like a museum shut down a show based on five people tweeting angrily about it over these years it's it it's it's wacky it's fearful but on a deeper level you could look at i mean I think the broader shifts in American culture, the shift away from organized religion, the shift away from thinking that America has good values or that America is a good country. And kind of some of that loss makes it easier to give up some of those old values. So like, let's say objectivity. 
it's true that no one's perfectly objective and that that's not anything we're ever going to perfectly achieve. But the old values say you still try, you still like work towards that. You still work toward to fulfill that. And the new movement says, because no one is perfectly objective, we should stop trying. It's a bad value. And I think it's like, you could think about it with the 1619 project. It's it's true. We should know the year 1619 and we should talk about it and we should talk about the history of slavery in America more. And, or at least when when that came out, it was making a good point. But it's not true that that's our country's true founding. And a kind of, I think Gen X and the boomers really allowed for an unmooring and, and a um, just loss of communal values that I think were unspoken before. And it turned out they needed to be spoken a little more. Yeah. Um, I mean, the way I often think about it, there was a, I can't remember his name. Um, there was a Jewish ethicist, very famous sort of ethical philosopher, I think at Boston, Boston University, who was a philanderer on the side. And <laughs> he was asked, how do you rec reconcile your, all your stuff about ethics when you're, you fall so far short. And mm. his answer was the sign pot, the sign pointing to Boston doesn't have to go there. Right. And oh, I love that. Yeah. And so the idea is that I love our, that I, we all fall short of ideals. That's why we call them ideals. The argument that we should abandon ideals because we fall short of them is crazy talk, but I think it is an ideological cul-de-sac, an enormous number of people, and we can talk about whether it's Foucault's fault or Nietzsche's fault or whoever, but it has become sort of instantiated in the culture in a big way that since everything's about power relations, therefore there's no reason to talk about right or wrong. It's just about winners and losers, yeah. oppressors and oppressed. The idea that I, I despise the phrase speak truth to power because the implicit assumption is that the people with power are bad and the people without it are good. And it turns out powerless people can be really shitty people. And, <laughs> and in part because they're so bitter about lacking power, the things they want to do are all about like retribution and violence rather than actually getting people to live up to those ideals in any way. And um, it's, it's just also, sort of a moral perversion that's sort of set in and in, been institutionalized. Well, it's, it's a little bit of laziness also, I think. Like, And that is kind of funny. I try to make it funny in the book, but like the... I mean, there's so many different examples. You could think about like the body positivity movement. Like, yes, we should not be rude to people who aren't thin. Like you shouldn't make fun of fat people. That's not nice. That's that's asshole-ish. But at the same time, there are certain foods that are healthier than other foods. And there are like, there is sort of a weight range we should all like try to be in, even if most Americans are over it. Like we, we shouldn't pretend like that's not actually the goal to be fit. And that that's sort of what the movement does. The movement says, well, because we're not achieving this, because, or, or maybe there are racial differences in achievement of this, we should stop measuring it. We should stop talking about it. We should pretend that that all foods are equally healthy. And it's like, it's like, hold on, guys. Like, I don't know if that actually helps people. Maybe it makes the experts feel better and maybe it's kind of a relief. I mean, it's like, it's like the efforts to ban accelerated math classes. This is my, my personal obsession is San Francisco's eighth grade algebra, which is a class that was an accelerated offering that you could test into. And guess who was making it in? It was, it was a, a disproportionate number of Asian students making it in and a disproportionately small number of black students making it in. And so instead of saying, let's make math education better in fifth, sixth, and seventh grade, the the progressive response was, and, and is across the country, but in San Francisco, it was early, was to say, let's ban eighth grade algebra. Let's throw the test out. Once we don't have the test, we'll never know. We won't, we, it, it gets rid of the racism. It gets rid of the whole problem. And it's like, well, I don't know that that achieved that. You just sort of blinded yourself. But I think there's a lot of very clever thinking over the last few years of people saying, here's a social problem, or here's a racial discrepancy, or here's a, a, a this going on. And the test, the measurement of it is flawed. So let's stop measuring it. Let's don't step on a scale. 
Right. Don't test the kids for their math ability. What is math? What's reading? Why do we need to be so <laughs> specific about it? And and I think part of that is just again a laziness, a decadence, an indulgence. So that 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 says who cares? And right. it's like, well, I kind of care. I think a lot of people care. So, I mean, the way I sometimes think about it is there will be no ugly people if we turn off all the lights. <laughs> right? I mean, you can't tell. Um, and but like you need light, right? And and also, like this is the frustrating thing about I mean, this gets to the sort of revolutionary aspect of these things, is that I have lots of complaints about the technocratic spirit and this idea that the state can micromanage people's lives and achieve all sorts of ends that it wants to have. But the old style sort of new even New Deal and Great Society liberals, as as mistaken as I think they were about all sorts of things, they at least believed that in order to fix a problem, you have to understand it and measure it, look at it, and yes, that's gone, right? And now it's like the results that's of the, the number one enemy. The, the old right. style liberal is the number one enemy. Like that's what the the book and really a lot of what we talk about, a lot of what the free press covers is like the battle between the old style liberal and the new progressive because yeah the old style liberal was all about measuring stuff and and figuring out how to make 7th grade algebra or 7th grade math better it's boring and it's and it's tedious kind of work but like the old style liberal was like the michael moore let's talk about um like who is it? Michael Moore. It's with school lunches or Jimmy Oliver school lunch obsession, right? Like that's, that's the old style liberal. And, and Michael Moore, let's say gun control. That's a really funny one because the new left, actually, the new progressive doesn't want gun control. And I try to make this argument in lots of social settings and people don't believe me, but the old liberal stance was like, we need to use cops to enforce this and get guns out of homes and all these unlicensed firearms. And the new stance is, well, we sort of liked that when the implication was that all the people with guns were Trumpers and on farmland. But we don't like that when it looks like also taking illegal guns from people in Chicago or people in LA. And so you have now district attorneys who over the years have come out explicitly saying Gun control is not a priority. Ill illegal gun possession is not a priority for our police right now. That's not a, something we're going to go after. And explicitly saying we're basically walking back from this. And you don't hear about the gun control movement much anymore because the gun control movement would involve cops. And it would involve cops going into uh, cities and asking for gun licenses. And so a lot of the old liberal values are that like to do that, to do gun control now would be cast as extraordinarily racist. And extraordinarily problematic. And, yeah, I mean, my friend yeah. Charlie Cook makes the point um, that there's this weird convergence um, insofar as the sort of hardcore Second Amendment gun rights crowd doesn't want there to be anti-gun crimes. And the hardcore left sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the crazy left wing prosecutors call them George Soros prosecutors. You say crazy, but they, they, they they run our biggest American cities. Yeah, crime, they don't, crime, but fighting. they don't want to prosecute gun crimes. Right. Yeah. So like one doesn't want to prosecute them, the gun crimes that exist. And the other one doesn't want the gun crimes to exist in the first place. And so you've basically decriminalized guns it, from both illegal ends. gun possession. Yes. Yeah. It's, it is one of the most, it's just fascinating. And it, it captures the, the, the friction between the new left and the and the old school liberal because like a lot of us are still sort of reeling around saying well i love michael moore i love the idea of gun control like this seems like something we all kind of agreed on but it turns out we didn't it, and, just to just to be clear i despise michael moore always have <laughs> always will um <laughs> he actually uh trained a camera 24-hour webcam into my bedroom wait you're uh, kidding 
No, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Specifically I, I your bedroom? Well, he thought it was my mom's bedroom. What? Um, this was during the Lewinsky stuff, and my mom was involved in all of that, and he thought he was making this really grand point about, like, invasion of privacy or something, and he got the room wrong. Um, <sighs> but it's a long story. We don't have to get into it. But <laughs> One I think day I want to hear that story, though. Holy shit. <laughs> but you should, uh, you should go back and read some of the stuff that was done by Salon and the City Paper about this guy who made his name being pro-union, basically firing anybody who tried to unionize at his own companies. Um, I think he's a horrible gargoyle of a human being, but that's a conversation for another day. Um, I do want to get into, um, uh, so I have this theory. I raised it with Caitlin Flanagan. She didn't necessarily want to play along um, as lovely <laughs> I, as she I is. I love Caitlin Flanagan She's so wonderful. much. She's truly Obsessed. wonderful. Um, I'll, I'll take her rejected question though. I'm, I'm in. Okay, okay, so um, it's a little convoluted, so I'll try to be, I'll try to do it clearly. I have this – take all foreign policy out of this. Just completely ignore what people mean when they say neoconservative if it conjures anything having to do with foreign policy. Um, the original neoconservatives in the 1960s and early 1970s were all former essentially either communists, New Dealers, or Great Society liberals. And – they went through a similar moment to what people like you are going through, which is realizing that the sort of revolutionary ardor, the ideological intensity, the utopianism was actually yielding all sorts of negative results. The whole idea of unattended consequences is basically a neocon thing from the 1960s and 70s. Journals like the Public Interest were founded to make this point, yet all these people, some of whom always stayed Democrats like Nathan Glazer and, and all these guys. But basically what they did was they said... Look, it turns out that human nature is a real thing, that if you enact policies that assume it away, you're going to get bad results as a consequence. And that Every generation true. comes to the same set of you – know, To one yeah. extent or another, yeah. And so, um, look, I, I love Barry, consider her a good friend, all that kind of stuff. I never fine. really, I never really liked the intellectual dark web piece. Um, <laughs> I thought it was fairly – uh, it basically felt like here are a bunch of interesting people I know, and I'm going to try to impose a coherent ideological paradigm on this whole group. And it turns out that the sane ones, a lot of them have been proven to be really terrible people who have gone completely bonkers. And some of them turn out to be great public intellectuals of the first order, you know, Steven Pinker and that kind of thing. But Sam Harris. Sam Harris. Yeah, sure. I mean, but the, but Stefan Malno and Charlie Kirk and Candace Owens, they're gargoyles. And, um, the, but the good ones were basically, um, they were essentially, you know, they would never use the word neoconservative, but they were go ones going through this same sort of psychological, sociological transformation of realizing, holy crap, I'm around a whole bunch of people who don't care about evidence mm. and don't, and want to wish away human nature. And when I look around at people like you, Caitlin Flanagan, um, I don't know, Yasha Monk, Jonathan Haidt, you can go through a list. Yeah. None of you people want to be called neoconservatives as far as I can tell. And that's fine, you know, because it's a, it's a dated term that conjures a certain, you know, peri or periods in American history. But the process is sort of the same. And um, it's sort of like there is now, whether you describe yourself left of center or right of center, there is this sort of like, we're not taking crazy pills. All of these other people are losing their minds, whether they're crazy nationalist populists or crazy left-wing populists. And, um, and I'm just wondering, like, does that, do, do you feel seen when I say this or do you reject this out of hand? Well, I don't, I don't know enough about what the term neoconservative means to accept or reject it, but, um, but I would say when I think about the IDW or the broader kind of collective of intellectuals, let's say, who freed themselves from old institutions, mm -hmm. that's really hard to be in the wilderness. It's mm -hmm. really hard to leave an institution, especially if you trained your whole life for institutional life. And most of us who've gone through the long march, the institutions yep. are trained for the institutions. Sure. And I think... A lot of people over the last few years, especially around COVID and around vaccines and things, they, they just went down rabbit holes. They they kind of lost moorings. I mean, um, we could debate whether that 
what's going on with Tucker post Fox? I, I mean, yeah. Or maybe Fox just sort of hid that and he was always this way. Um, but I think for us and for me, I think about it a lot with, with the free press. Are we anti-institution? And I don't think so necessarily. Like I think a lot of us left mainstream media, certainly. But the reason we're banding together and not just doing random substacks individually is because there's strength in coming together and in having community and not going down rabbit holes and being alone with your thoughts and research. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think your critique of what happened with a lot of the people affiliated with that is really totally fair and, and sad when I think about it. Um, but Neocon, not neocon. I don't, you know. No, it's fine. I don't care about the label, right? I mean, the, my point is, is like, it's, it's, um, you know, I mean, I, I can do really, I can get really deep in weeds about this because like, um, and I totally with you about like, it's good to have institutions. I was at National Review for two decades, you know, um, um, I think it's hard to be on your own. And once you start seeing how much the old world lies, which it lies a lot, like, there's a reason COVID led to so many conspiracy theories because so many people in the institutions we were supposed to trust lied to us and they lied a lot. And so it's understandable that people would spin out from that and say, you know what? I don't believe anything they say. And, and it's like, <laughs> I mean, for me, let's say with Russiagate and the Times, I was hook, line, and sinker in for Russiagate. I believed it. I believed every piece of it. And when that was exposed as basically I'd been taken on a ride, it was really disruptive to me. Like, it was really like, who do I trust? What can I trust? How was I just lied to? How did I, how was I so foolish that I went along with that? And yeah, I, you could look at a bunch of examples of this. And and once the mainstream institutions lose trust, yeah, it'll spin out into conspiracies. And yeah, people will get a little wacky and, and be more than wacky because so, there's nothing to hold on to. So how much of it do you consider to be deliberate lies? Like the public can't handle the truth, so we have to shade it or whatever, or just partisan stuff. And how much of it has to do with... um. Group think. I think that, Russiagate was deliberate. So you think Russiagate was deliberate? Yeah. And um, in what way? Tell me more about how, because on Russiagate, I, I feel I think lying about fine. COVID I origins. stayed out of it to the most part because I just didn't know. And I didn't, I, having not trusted the New York Times my entire adult life and raised by a father who loved to complain about the New York Times. The New York Times, my dad was a pretty prominent journalist and his favorite pastime was complaining about the New York Times, <laughs> but he thought it deserved his enmity because it was a good enough institution that it was, you know, and like he could go on for 45 minutes about how the New York Times insisted on calling Fidel Castro, Dr. Castro, because he had a friggin' law degree and they didn't call any other lawyer in the world. <laughs> doctor. Stop it. Um, so like, it that goes is back. really funny. Yeah, no, it's amazing. So like, I, I but so like I, on the Russiagate stuff, I just, I was like, I thought it was perfectly plausible that Russia, that Trump could be doing stuff because I didn't think Trump had the character not to do it if he thought he could see his advantage. But I never saw any evidence that sort of nailed it. So I just sort of said, I'll wait and see. But like, concretely, like, what, what were people doing that you think they knew the truth and they were lying about it? I think the we can do Russiagate, but the even more sort of modern one that's in people's lives now is COVID origins. I think anyone with anything between their ears We'll tell you that it sure seemed likely that the Wuhan Institute of Virology that was studying COVID might be the place where the COVID came from. That was the new COVID that they'd been studying. And you saw a total media blackout of that. You saw not just media blackout, but places were kicked off Facebook and Twitter for writing about it, for questioning it. If you posted about it, you were banned. Um, and... I think a lot of people knew exactly what was happening. And you had you had high-ranking government officials actively hiding the, the the paper trail. Now we're starting to see emails leak out showing how how conscientious that was. Or conscious, also conscientious. Um 
And yeah, I think it was a deliberate campaign to mislead the American public. I, I think I think it's obvious now that it was. And the American media went along with it completely. And and for me, because I was a little further along in my education, as it were, by that point, I saw a couple of blogs that traced the Wuhan Institute and wrote about this and that blogs that were quickly banned from social media, like Zero Hedge. And it pretty much made sense. And so I would just, I think a lot of us kind of just watched and lost a lot of faith in our mainstream institutions at NPR and Washington Post and New York Times. And it's sort of the kind of bedrock of liberal American media lost a lot of faith in those from watching them hide that story. And, and yeah, I don't think, I don't think anyone was being naive. I don't think anyone, I think it was very deliberate and very calculated. And it was something that obviously the Biden administration was on board with and, and our media class was on board with. Right. Like it's, the lies, it's, just in fairness, the lies, I, I agree with you entirely about how this was a, I mean, it was a lie and it was a dishonest lie. And it was, it wasn't just that it was a design. It, it wasn't just that it was a lie. It was that the way they try to delegitimize anyone who said, wait a second, like really, uh, this is, this is not a legitimate path of inquiry. Cause like, you know, it, it could have turned out that it wasn't from Wuhan, but like sure, Occam's, of course. Occam's razor says, this is something worth looking at, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like it, of course it could have been not from that, but it, it was like the, the immediate banning, the fact that the New York times top COVID reporter said, looking into the COVID, talking about the COVID origin lab leak is racist and xenophobic. She wrote that. The top New York Times COVID reporter said it's racist to talk about it. So that was a pretty loud and clear message. Yeah, so and I agree with that. But that, that stuff started under Trump. I mean, just to be clear, right? And I mean, Matt Ridley was writing about possible COVID origins and you had, um, um, you know, and a lot of the lies that came from Fauci, you know, starting with like the do wear masks, don't wear masks stuff uh, that definitely started under Trump, I'm not saying that, and look, I mean, look, and, and Trump, you know, he was like in a week, it'll be gone. I mean, he just, he just <laughs> yeah, lies. I, <laughs> but, um, all sorts of other schemes. But I guess the question I have is, is, is where, what, what was the, in your view, what was the primary or even secondary? Because I think a lot of things have multiple explanations, but like, what was the motivation for the lie? Was that, was it Chinese funding all sorts of research stuff that they didn't want to lose access to? Was it that this will feed into it, it, this will give a win to the worst pe to the right wing people and we can't allow that? Is is it what what was the the thinking behind it? I think it's a mix of both those things that you just said. I think it's um, it's that there's a softness to China and the CCP and a sort of willingness to believe their party line. I think it would have implicated the American government in the research or whatever, or being weak on this and not seeing it or, or helping fund it. And I think that there is a movement that, that, that the new progressive doesn't, <laughs> sorry, our dog, that the new progressive doesn't like questioning the NIH and these institutions. They've become very like, um, almost holy. And, and then it just became the party line. Like once it's established that we're not going to insult China in this and we're not going to question our government health organizations because they have to be holy. Everyone gets in step. I mean, because you could very easily make arguments that sound leftist or liberal against all these points. So it doesn't seem rational, like even the racist idea. To me, it was always much more racist to imply that COVID came from Chinese people eating weird animals at a wet market. Like that, that's an old racist trope against the Chinese, actually. And so, um, sorry, my dog is going to be yapping. And so I think. Um, I think the, your dog is a big Fauci fan and he's she not going to stand she by is. this. Dolly's a big Fauci fan, actually. <laughs> um, but, but the. Let me put her on my lap. Oh. Hi, come sit on my lap. This is our dog. Her name is Dolly. She's so good. 
Don't. But I brought her into the office today because Bear's doing an interview at home. So I tried to free Bear from having a, a, a dog barking at her interview. I took the dog. Um, but yeah, why the obsession with, with protecting China from having any guilt on this matter? I think it's all those factors. Um, but, so, uh, But once the mainstream media ran with the lie, it, it becomes hard to trust them on anything. It's like once they're running with that lie, then why should I believe them if they say the vaccine is safe? And then and then you have a huge population in America who isn't going to believe that and isn't going to have faith in that. And that then it gets dangerous. So so many of these things, it's like it's like the reason we have to protect these institutions is because uh, uh, like the future of America relies on it and relies on some amount of trust being maintained and some amount of trust in, in these places being maintained. No, I, look, I agree with that entirely. Institutions are supposed to be essentially the editors of society. Yeah. And so far as they're the ones who say, Hey, this raw copy, you're running way too hot. Go back and check your facts. And that's not just true with like newspaper editors. It's true with like the NIH. It's true with all these institutions. They're the ones who are supposed to say, slow your roll, do the process the right way, come back when you've got this stuff nailed down. And in the era of social media, it's just so much easier to have these open circuits that just send this stuff straight out to the public without sort of editorial control of of the product and, and go ahead no and the revolution that that you and i both talk about a lot the revolution would say that facts in a similar way it's kind of a mirror to the trump how, how a lot of the trump campaign works that facts don't matter as much as goals and politics that anything is justified to get to the goal so even if smart people within the revolution knew it wasn't racist to talk about the lab leak they all got on board because it was kind of decided this is an, this is the goal this is the important thing we need to achieve and facts don't matter as much objectivity we know is white supremacy and and kind of having a shared reality is fake anyway so why even try and it it won for years that won like, that's what's so amazing is now we sit around, you and I agree, right? Like, you and I are on the same page about this. But the part of the reason, not to bring it back to my book, part of what you're I described forgiven. in my you're, book. You're doing a pretty good job of no, not but, being shameless about it. But no, uh, but part of the reason I wanted to write the book is to preserve this be, and yeah. to say this happened. These scenes happened because people now will try very hard to pretend it never happened. What you and I are saying sounds super reasonable now in many leftist liberal spaces. The New York Times just today has a piece about the, the how COVID probably came from a lab. Literally, today. 2024. And I think I I wanted to put it down in text and say, you can't deny what happened for four years and this kind of um some of the psychosis, some of the some of the totally irrational things. And and in the process of it, a lot of people lost their jobs, lost their livelihoods, lost, lost their reputations, were, were smeared. A lot of people got screwed by this. And in the case of COVID, let's say to stay on that, not that COVID's not a major topic of the book. So don't, if, if you're a listener and you're thinking you're buying this for COVID theories, it's not, you're, you'll be disappointed. But um, in the case of COVID, like a lot of damage was done by, by denying where it came from and, and talking about where it came from. We lost a lot of time in figuring it. I mean, you could talk, you could go through the ramifications. Well, also just like I mean, the lack of I mean, I, I talked to Caitlin about this last week, but um, the public health experts who insisted that you can't go to your parents' oh hospital room, or you can't go to a funeral, or you can't go to a wedding, but you can of course mass uh, have mass demonstrations. Yes, against those racism. are COVID free zones. Those right. are COVID free zones. You're you're safe from COVID. No, it was used after the initial lockdowns and the initial sort of panic that I everyone was scared. I was scared. I was so thrilled to get the vaccine. I got I went I went to an old people's home and got it in the basement because they had some extras that were going to expire or something. I was like I was obsessed with that. But after getting vaccinated, the insistence that these things stay closed, that the beaches stay closed, that the churches, the synagogues, every the mosques have to stay closed. Like 
this was part of a social movement. This was part of a revolution. And it, you see it now in the emails where you have mayors emailing, you, you, you see different mayors, different public health officials emailing each other saying, are you going to let them have um, sports this weekend? Are you going to let them have this this weekend? And it's like, it was being decided in a completely irrational, completely political way. And that's, I think, why a lot of these ideas that now to us seem so bizarre, why a lot of them were so successful, because a lot of us were destabilized and um, unplugged from our worlds, unplugged from the moderating forces in our lives, from our communities. We were stuck online and getting into weird rages. And it was like four years of rages. So... um Pulling away from COVID just for a second. Um, like back when you were in nursery school or first grade or whatever, there was this big event um, uh, where Dan Rather, as I put it at the time, um, climbed up the jackass tree and then hit every branch as he fell down out of it, um, where he insisted that he had this famous memo that um, proved that George W. Bush had been AWOL and it turned out to be bogus. And um, and that's actually one of the things that sort of launched a big chunk of the blogging era back in the day where these like freelance independent people who like did the deep dives and figured out like this typewriter didn't exist when they claim it did and all that kind of stuff. It was a lot of fun. And um, um, but my take on that always was that it was a good example of the dangers of groupthink, where there was nobody at 60 Minutes who didn't want the story to be true. And so no one said, hey, you know, maybe we shouldn't do, as our expert on typeface, this orthodontist from Cleveland or whatever it was who doesn't know anything about this, like maybe we should check with somebody else to really nail this down before we release this huge thing. And I think that like a vast amount of our problems with the failures of our institutions is that they are monocultures of elite progressive people who all read from the same hymnal. They all work from the same assumptions. And it's sort of like, I've always said government, any government room where they're about to announce some thing, whatever it is, with some initiative, they should have at least one libertarian in the room who says, maybe we shouldn't do anything at all. And if you can't satisfy that objection, then you shouldn't do it, right? You need some skeptic, some devil's advocate, someone in the room to say, you guys are getting way, carried way out over your skis. You don't, you know, slow your roll, think about this, check your facts. And so many of our elite institutions don't have those anymore. And so I'm wondering, like you're emphasizing a lot, and obviously I agree with you about with the problems of the ideological constructs of these revolutionaries and the revolution and all that stuff. I agree with you entirely on the problems with those ideas. But how much of those ideas are just pretexts for rationalizing the groupthink, right? The partisan groupthink, the the elite groupthink, um, and how much of it is actually shaping them? I mean, where, where, which, where, how much? Obviously, it's both. But like, how do you adjudicate between chicken and egg in some of these things? Okay, let me try to repeat it back to you to see how, meaning, so look, how look, much I mean, is it people just wanting to sort of like be in the good and how much of it is yeah, I mean, true right, believers so or we can is take it, it? We can take it back to um, the COVID stuff, right? Um, or a lot of these people thought they were right, right? And the the revolution stuff, the idea, intellectual framework You're saying most people are just sheep going along with things. Yeah. 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 No, like, it, of course. And in a lot of ways, that's a good part of human nature. Like, for most of my life, I was just a sheep going along with the politics of my cohort and um, trying to succeed within the structure that I was given. And I trusted the structure and the institutions to lead me in a good way. I trusted the New York Times to fulfill the values it said it was working to fulfill and to have the mission it said it was its mission. I mean, I don't think it's necessarily like you don't 
want a culture where everyone's always questioning everything and and that would be exhausting and that would be um miserable like i was kind of forced into having to start questioning it because it got so egregious it got so um miserable as a writer when you're told you can't write about the most interesting things out there but i think a ton of people are just going along with things going along with the flow and as soon as they as soon as the movement becomes just a little too much, they they can they break out. But um, no, a lot of people are just trying to get along and trying to keep their jobs and do well and keep their friends. And um, now it's all hunky dory in my life, and it's we're, I, we love our new world, and we've got this new new institution that we're building and all this. But it was miserable for a couple of years to 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 do that and to. Even if I knew, oh, yes, I'm right about this or I'm right about that, it was still miserable. I still lost real friends and things like that. And so, yeah, a lot of people are going along with something they know is not true because it's fine or it's useful enough. And they broadly agree that Trump is worse. So, why question the movement? Like, do you really want to make it easier for? The, the, for Trump to criticize us by pointing out issues with our ideas right now. Come on. A lot of people are just going along with things. And I don't necessarily think, yeah, I don't blame them and think that everyone should stand up and be a rebel because the cost is real. And in the cost for, for academia, the cost is most certainly your job. Um, and that's too much for most people. That's so. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't fault them, but I do think, of course, a lot of what we're seeing is smart people just shutting off part of their brain and going along with it. Um, since I've promised to not keep you long, and I have an abiding phobia, even though we are not in the same room, of ever being with a woman when she goes into labor, I will. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I've, I've got a few weeks still. I don't think he's coming yet. <laughs> it's just, it, but it's weird. It's my own weird lizard brain. It's just like I get no fear nervous. of extremely pregnant women is a really smart thing. We're we're speaking of irrational. We're wildly irrational. Um, you know, very hot emotions. You no know, bear bear lives in fear right now. Yeah, which is good. I, I like to keep her in that state, kind of on her toes. I, I just live in abject terror of having to step up and help deliver a baby. And even <laughs> though I know that's not possible on this podcast. We're going to um, do it over Zoom right now. Yeah. Um, although that would be great for traffic. Um, <laughs> but I do want to leave on a sort of more upbeat notice, note. So like, um, you noted today, we're recording on Monday. The Times just ran this piece saying, never mind, it probably was a lab You got to love it. You right? got to love it. Um, you can, the Democratic Party abandoned defund the police to a large extent, right? They elected a guy who said he wasn't into that. Um, um, it does feel at the margins, even though the, among a lot of people on the right, the paranoia about wokeism and all that kind of stuff continues to intensify. Um, and I'm not saying there aren't things to be freaked out about or bothered by and all that kind of stuff. And we didn't even talk about the transgender stuff, but that's fine. Um, you did see a bunch of school elite schools say, um, yeah, that whole idea of getting rid of the SAT, right. The turning off the lights so we won't see ugly people kind of thing. Um, uh, never mind. We're bringing back the SAT, right. Uh, a lot of places are sort of quietly moving away from DEI, a lot of institutions are saying, you know what, we're going to stop taking positions on every political issue, which I think is really a good idea. Um, I guess the question is, is nature healing, right? Is, mm. is, a, a, do we hit peak woke and now grudgingly this, what I would call the sort of uh, realizations of sort of small and neoconservatism are starting to creep in at the margins in places, or do you think things are going to get worse again before they get better? And the stuff that you're writing about. I think a lot of the excesses are now being, yes, memory hold, cut back. I think the 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 shift that the revolution brought is real and happened. And there is a real move in the Overton window, whatever you want to call it. But yes, the fringes, the most extreme ideas, those are being dropped and, and now are sort of embarrassing and a little hokey to talk about or 
reference. Except um, for the anti-Israel stuff, which is still getting worse. Well, but yeah, that's, a, that's, not, that's a carve okay. out that's worth noting, but like, um, you know. Yeah. And that we'll, we'll see. I mean, there's a lot we can talk about, but um, yeah, some of the excesses Harvard today announced they are dropping their mandatory DEI statements. There's definitely, definitely an element of walking back. The, the revolution kind of peaked and then now we're in some sort of settling point. I don't think we're settling at the same point where we started is basically my argument. But yes, the heat and the frenzy, you're not seeing the burning buildings right now. Um, I would say also not settling where we started. And I will believe that we have had some kind of reformation or or moderate revival or um, that the, the revolution's really been walked back when we see people get their jobs back, when we see, let's say, the, the trans stuff, which we didn't talk about, when we see Abigail Schreier get an apology from the kind of people who called her transphobic for, for arguing and writing about a topic that now her argument is the baseline. I mean, it's the UK policy, it's the NIH policy. And so when she gets an apology, when she, when, when people who were early to some of these topics get their jobs back, get their apologies, get vindicated and get some kind of reputational, um, not that Abigail needs it from these people, but like it, when there's some sort of real reckoning and acknowledgement, then I'll believe it. But even, I know we keep talking about COVID, look, the Times ran that story today. They still have up. I mean, I think it's a tweet that's my favorite. It's like that uh, that calls COVID, the lab leak, a um, a conspiracy theory. They, the Washington Post still has up an article that calls it a far right conspiracy theory to say it came from a lab. It, those aren't retracted. So, yes, the the heat of the revolution has passed, and we are in the morning after. But um, it doesn't mean that we're we're back where we began. No, I think that's fair. I mean, look, as someone who holds a lot of paper for the damage the 1960s did, um, a lot of that, a lot of the excesses of the 1960s, the culture tried to correct for, but it never went back to the 1950s. Yeah, exactly. Nor would I want to go back to the 1950s. My point is, it's just simply that that there's a ratchet effect, right? Yeah. And that you can't turn back some of this stuff, but. But Not no, I'm happy with some of the improvements. I'm of yeah. course, like as like a again, like a moderate, boring, like lib. I'm I, I, I like I like some of the stuff that's some of the changes that we're seeing and some of the walking back. And I'm even fine on some level with the memory holding. I, it's human nature. I would do the same thing. Uh, I, I I memory hold all sorts of embarrassing policies or politics I had like as a teenager. <laughs> um, but but. Yeah, I, I, I think you, you and I agree on that. On the... Okay, uh, Nellie Bowles. The book is uh, "Morning After the Revolution: Dispatches from the Wrong Side of History." I highly recommend it. It's um, you don't have to agree with every. I mean, I agree with. I, I don't know. I haven't <laughs> encountered much I've disagreed with, but like, um, uh, but you can appreciate it just because it's a lovely piece of writing, and um, I think people would get a lot out of it. And I agree with you about not memory holding stuff. Um, like I, I think the, there's a lot of stuff that has been memory hold and um, my whole life is about holding receipts. So, um, um, but thank you again for being on and I hope you'll come back. Thank you so much for having me on and any time I, and especially any, any question, any question rejected from another host, I will gladly take, <laughs> I, I um, or another guest I'll gladly take. And no, it's a pleasure to be on. Thank you for having me.